Hello, commentary fans. This is Mike again, and I am back with you after the ambitious Avengers commentary. And today, we're going to go into some familiar waters. My choice for the film today is the 1979 version of Dracula. And it's a good one. It um, is pretty faithful to... Not necessarily the story, but the Dracula myth. And it goes through all the familiar tropes and ways that I think might be the best out of any adaptation of the Dracula legend. Uh, it stars Frank Langella in a role that really made him a, a star. And it's a role that has cast a shadow, or his interpretation of the role has cast a shadow over just vampirism in popular culture for everything that's come since. And it also stars Laurence Olivier, a pretty old and feeble Laurence Olivier, but he gives a pretty decent performance, and he's pretty good in the movie as Van Helsing. It's directed by John Badham, who gave us Saturday Night Fever, and this, of course, is his follow-up to it, but... We are paused on the sky. We're drifting into the universal Earth or globe. And I am going to start the film in three, two, and one. Here it is, the universal globe. And, you know, the this um, version of it, the universal and MCA company is really just kind of gets Jaws in my mind. You know, it's the version that I most see it with. And uh, we're beginning the film with a wolf howling, and it, it's really... This one understands what it's all about. Uh, for all the times that Universal has um, revisited their monsters, there really hasn't been a whole lot of success in doing that. I think a lot of the times they don't truly understand, you know, what made those monsters work. Um, it was, I think a lot of the times, you know, you're an executive at Universal, you're saying, oh, you know, people view the monsters like they do comic books or you know, just any pop culture thing and they take it for just their aesthetic value and that's at least as from what my standpoint is that's never been what the monsters were all about I've always felt that the monsters are more than the aesthetics that they're really about the motivations and the acting and just kind of the dissection of what those monsters were. And above anything else, all of those monster films from the 30s, the 40s, had a lot of class to them. Here we are opening on the Demeter. And this is a interesting beginning because it really shows you how far they've come since the original Dracula. This Dracula is very, version of Dracula is very adult and it's um, it's not afraid to dabble in a little gore. There's some pretty grisly images in here in this beginning and they're very haunting images as well. Uh, as I was saying about the monsters revisiting, kind of universal revisiting the monsters, I really think that this has been since uh, the 40s, since the classic horror cycle like ended, that this has been Universal's only successful effort in, you know, taking a look back at the monsters and trying to revisit them for and recreate them for a modern audience. Um, I think a large part of that is the fact that it didn't really come up from Universal. It was really 
um, the fact that, like in 1927, when Dracula came to Broadway, the idea that the theater was what recreated the monsters. And around the mid-70s, there was an, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, a reissue, not a reissue, um, a new production of the Hamilton Dean play that uh, Lugosi originally um, portrayed on Broadway. And I don't know, you know, like, who, who knows why plays refined an audience, but this version of Dracula was tremendously successful. And, of course, a lot of people think the reason it was was that they found Frank Langella to portray the role. And, as we'll see later on, he owes a tremendous amount to Lugosi. I think he took what Lugosi did and um, went even further with it. His Dracula is very sexual, very much a man of mystery. And um, when they tried, when, the, when um, John Badham decided to bring Dracula back to the big screen, I think he very much realized that that was the appeal when Lugosi did it, and when Langella did it. Here we're being introduced to Lucy and Mina. And uh, Mina, our Lucy, is the main character, and she's played by Kate Nelligan. And what we're going to find out is that she really plays a major part in this film. We are not shadows, and I, uh, I think that is kind of what really draws me to this film. Uh, when I first saw this version of Dracula, I, I gotta admit, I, it wasn't a film that impressed me on the first viewing. I thought it was really just about Langella being a pretty boy. But I think what really has brought me into the film over uh, subsequent viewings and what has um, uh, really made me appreciate it more and appreciate even Langella's performance more is Kate Nelligan's Lucy. She is what a lot of Dracula films and Dracula adaptations have been lacking a really really strong female character who the who they trust to make their own decisions again this film is the same or at least its seeds are from the same uh Hamilton Dean Dracula play that the original uh Lugosi uh, film was based on, and I think this is an exceptionally well-staged and well-written film in that it really is its own entity. It borrows from the two most classical Dracula stories. Of course, the original Stoker novel, not really for uh, plot, but really for the imagery and kind of the most iconic um, scares, but also it takes the um, the original Hamilton Dean play and kind of uses it as a thin structure, but it's not trapped by either the Stoker novel or the Hamilton Dean play, and there's a lot of creativity here. And one thing I think you'll notice about this Dracula just opening in with the first scene on the Demeter and kind of um, this scene here is that it goes for incredible sets, lavish costumes, and above all, just these huge 
action set pieces. This is an incredible scene. And really, that is an improvement over really any adaptation of Dracula. Like, because it doesn't fall into the traps of, you know, trying to be too faithful to this play. You know, as we saw with the original Lugosi film, I was kind of trapped by it. And they stuck to, like, the continuities of time and space. And so you're stuck like in a sitting room for most of it. And here, we're already having a scene where the incredible sinking ship and it being washed into this giant cave, and here Mina is going to um, rescue the Count. Here's a uh, subtle touch that I really like, is that you know that wolf there, was actually Count Dracula, and when Mina uh, finds the Count, he's in this uh, um, fur coat that's obviously made of wolf hair, and that's kind of interesting. And I love his um, hand coming out like that. You know, you could say that uh, Langella had that same ability that Lugosi had, like the hands being so expressive and being integral into his creation of the character, but I like that because it kind of shows the vulnerabilities of this Dracula, but also, you know, you see those, his uh, long fingers coming out, and it's almost like, uh, you know, the bat's talons or claws. I don't know what the technical term for that is. I'll probably just embarrass myself. I think just looking at any version of Dracula, you have to, there's some tropes that I think it needs to follow in order for the picture to be a success. And I think we'll go into them as they come along, but I think the opening scene with the Demeter and the ship is something that every good Dracula needs, because I really... Just, I just think it's a incredible scene, you know, then it offers for a whole lot of um, brilliant dramatic choices and um, the best versions, the film versions of Dracula all have it. It probably was done best than Nosferatu, but this is a close second because this film uh, is braver and because it was released at a different time that it's got the... Uh, ability to have a little gore be a little bit more extreme. Here we have Donald Pleasance as uh, Professor uh, Seward and uh, <laughs> you know uh, I'll, I'll be honest uh, he's really uh, he's a terrific actor but you know just kinda seeing him I'm automatically in you know I, it's hard. He's, I, he's someone I've seen in the Halloween film so uh, so many times that it's hard to see him in any role. But I think he's really uh, a strong point of this film. There's a gruesome scene. The guy with his throat ripped out. The captain tied to the wheel. And that is uh, really incredible. And that's something about this version of Dracula is that um, it's really the first version of it to have adult violence and gore that wasn't, um, you know, too cartoony. Um, of course, we had uh, the Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing Hammer films, but, you know, that had the Kensington gore, which was really, really uh, theatrical, and it just kind of looked goofy, but that image of the uh, um, the captain with his throat ripped out is pretty horrific, and it's really interesting. Here we have Renfield, and I think that for all the kind of strengths of this movie, Renfield is something of a weakness in that um, 
it steers away from both the novel and the play, and he kind of, like, it tries to do what, um, the Dwight Fry is that he's sort of somewhat sane beforehand, but here he's kind of a sleazy lowlife who hangs around in that broken abbey before he encounters, uh, Dracula. There we have Donald Pleasance, and you, you gotta keep an eye on him throughout the course of this movie, because... He does this trick, and um, I didn't really necessarily notice it the first time, but I watched the film with uh, the director, uh, John Badham's uh, commentary, and he relates this story of the film um, in the commentary about how Donald Pleasance uh, asked if uh, he could like have a bag of like uh, candies. I guess he's, well, they look like malted milk balls or something. But he says, he asked them, you know, could I have them around the screen? And, you know, John Badham said, you know, sure, why not? And <laughs> whenever uh, the character of Dr. Seward is nervous, he takes out this uh, bag of candies from uh, his jacket and eats them. And it's really kind of funny. And you got to keep your eye out because it's really a great... Um, uh, aspect of the character like he does it as he's nervous and then you know as the over the course of the film you know when they encounter all the ghouls and stuff he it just gets more interesting and kind of comical and you know that's really what I like about uh, Donald Pleasant's um, interpretation of the character in this film is that he is kind of comical and he is kind of a loon and you know that's a much more interesting interpretation you know, it, and it works well off of uh, Van Helsing, who is always, you know, stern, and he's comical, but he isn't uh, stupid, and that is really interesting. And of course, when you have a talent like Donald uh, Pleasance doing it, it just adds so much to the film. I like these point of view shots of the bat; they're really kind of interesting, and you know. They just make up for the fact that we have a fake bat, but, uh, you know, it's just, just about how you film that bat and what you do to uh, make it more interesting. Uh, one thing about this version of uh, Dracula is that um, the Transylvania bit of the story is completely cut out and over the course of the film they try to uh, do that like you know they try to take some of the imagery that's famous from uh, both versions of Dracula uh, the Transylvania and the Transylvanian scene in the first half of the Stoker novel where Harker is um, imprisoned in Castle Dracula and they try to use some of that here but uh it's not always successful and I think it um, I think the film would have been more interesting had they actually wrote a bit in the beginning where he uh, where they actually go to Transylvania but I think it just probably would have slowed things down narratively but it would have been more interesting in terms of kind of like the sets that they could have built and kind of what Langella could have done with the character and here we have Langella, and I'm sorry I missed uh, his introduction, but um, he is absolutely incredible in the role. And, you know, this is a Dracula that we haven't seen before. Here's a perfect example of how the character is different from any version of Dracula that's come before. Uh, you have uh, Lucy here blatant, blatantly call him out and say, you know, I don't see how anybody could love um, living in that old dilapidated Carfax Abbey. And, you know, Langella, with his interpretation of the character, Dracula is, of course, incredibly eccentric. But Langella... In a way, he doesn't downplay the eccentricities. He wears them on his sleeve. 
but they become like aspects of a finer character that you almost like make the eccentricities of Dracula look dignified to the point where you believe them. Here we have Donald Pleasance offering uh, <laughs> Dracula some wine, which is uh, uh, directly from the probably the most famous moment in Lugosi's interpretation of the character. And supposedly, when they uh, brought this Langella revival to Broadway, that's what the, that's the term I was looking for—a Broadway revival. Um, they said when they looked at the script, they thought that that was actually in the uh, the actual play, and then they felt that they had to add it almost because everybody would be expecting it. Here's a, that's a great aspect of the character. Like I was saying earlier, um, one thing about the Lugosi film and the uh, Hamilton Dean play is that Dracula masquerades as a, as a nobleman living among the living. And the fact is that there's a disconnect with... Um, the living because Dracula isn't a man he's more of a monster he's more of a thing and so this thing has to pretend to be a man and Lugosi does it a little bit like in to truth be told in the film version there's not a whole they don't do a whole lot because once Lugosi uh his character comes to uh England they kind of like it becomes as we said the uh vampire uh the vampire hunters movie but langella fits right at home here and mina accuses him of having a great lust for life and you definitely uh see that in langella he becomes the life of the party and even as he's talking about you know, uh goofy horror film troops like oh the love of being frightened or Nosferatu, you know, he still seems like a party guest you'd really would love to have around. And above anything else, Langella is really charming as this public face of Dracula. He really, you know, he's courteous, he's polite, and he's got a deepness to him. And... It's just a real fresh take on the character at this point. And Langella, of course, does it really, really well. But I think that in Langella, you come to have something of a problem in that, in that um, this is the origin of the romantic vampire. The idea that vampirism can be fun. And, you know, just with everything that's done original, or, you know, everything that is fresh, you know, it kind of is done over and over again to the point where it just kind of loses its original meaning. And it's unfortunate but I think we can appreciate Langella. And as we're going to find out, it isn't just uh, Langella in this film. It is Kate Nelligan as Lucy. Like, they give a lot to each other, and they enhance each other's characters. Had it just been Langella and... Um, a one-dimensional female character that he uh, seduces, I think the film would have been a heck of a lot less interesting. And it just, you know, I think what this film understands is that what makes a great uh, vampire film is having a strong heroine with the vampire, or at least having a fully fleshed out heroine. And this is 
the first version of the story, or the film first film version of the story. Maybe Nosferatu. Uh, you could argue that Nosferatu did also, but to have a strong female character to match wits with it. Dracula, and this is the origin of their relationship right here, that you see them dancing, and I think partially what is, what is ingrained in this version of the story is that Dracula is a man of mystery as well as an icon of horror, and that I think is what the best versions of Dracula do. The original uh, tagline for this uh, film was the strangest passion, or the original tagline for the 1931 film, uh, forgive me, was the strangest passion the world has ever known, and it's just as applicable here. This is a Dracula very much after what I think Lugosi wanted in the character, to be this kind of exotic lover. And Langella gets to live that version. Here we have um, the relationship between uh, Lucy and Harker. And I think what's interesting about this movie is that Harker isn't the uh, isn't a good um, match for Lucy in terms of that the movie does try to uh, play with the. Uh, kind of like the history and the society at the time, and Lucy wants to uh, be a uh, strong, independent woman. I guess you could maybe see, like, the seeds of suffer being a suffragette in her. Like, earlier she said she that women are not meant to be chattels. And then Harker, you see, you see here, like, in just about any version of Dracula, is that he's very career oriented and here he sort of sees uh, Lucy as his and um, I think over the course of the film Dracula tests her uh, her loyalty in that maybe the he can offer her more than Harker and it's an interesting uh take on the character and just on the whole story is that vampirism from Dracula here might be more freeing than being a woman at this time and that's never had never really been done before you know the whole thing about the Dracula story is that it has Van Helsing, Dr. Seward, Harker, and then uh, Quincy Morris and Arthur Holmwood in the novel all fighting for Mina's soul. And Dracula wanting Mina to be his bride. And the whole idea is that uh, Dracula sees um, Mina as almost a slave. But, you know, just kind of looking at it, this is an incredible effect here. Langella moving down the uh, the wall. It's taken right out of the Stoker novel, and I imagine it was filmed tremendously uh, simply, but it's really is effective. There's a lot of um, neatly staged. Uh, sequences in that. The movie definitely exploits the Dracula legend. And here is a scene like where it's actually frightening. Like this is probably the most frightening sequence in the movie. Just kind of 
you get the feeling that Lucy is powerless, or uh, Mina in this case is powerless. This is one where they uh, switch the uh, names of the character, and eventually later on, um, you see that uh, Lucy becomes intrigued, but Mina here looks very frightened, and Langella uses his uh, body, and especially his eyes here. He has such tremendously haunting brown eyes, and it's really, it really is an incredible sequence, and it's very frightening, but it's also very sexual at the same time. And, uh, you know, as I was saying earlier, you don't really know why a story can be uh, picked up by different uh, generations, you know? Like a play could come back and have a revival and be successful, and then other times people look at it like it's goofy, and then, you know, just like Shakespeare, uh, you know, like they say that all of Shakespeare is timeless because so many of his plays be, become uh, symbols of different times. And this version of Dracula surely did uh, become a, uh, a staple of the time that it was in. And I've heard different accounts of the actual play version. Some said it was very campy, which I really would find kind of hard to believe because Langella is so sincere in his performance here that, you know, I I just don't, I don't believe that at all. I think what drew people to Langella's um, interpretation of the character is just kind of how bold he is and the fact that he was so sexy. And that really, I think, is what Lugosi did as well. And I think the right word would be magnetism. Here we have Renfield, kind of his introduction. And I think every good um, uh, version of Dracula needs the character of Renfield. Just because, especially versions where it tries to make Dracula uh, sexy. They need a version of Renfield because he's more horrible and he really is vampirism without any of the masks hiding the unsavory aspects. And this version of Renfield, like, I don't think he fits into the narrative all that well. Because, like, he kind of becomes an afterthought. Right after this, he gets locked up. But the, um, the scenes with him uh, eating the bugs and stuff are the most realistic. It's really, you know, Dwight Fry, you never got a close-up of what he had, and it's just, and the other ones, they're real theatrical, but that's a live cockroach there, and that's really, uh, uh, really gross. It's a good gross-out scene. And, like, all of a sudden, after he's bitten by that bat, he gets a uh, taste for uh, cockroaches. And it's an interesting scene. I like the fact that uh, it's um, more about uh, Dracula uh, kind of giving Renfield. It's almost more of a consensual partnership. And... You know, Dracula just comes in there and says you can reward him with a log fulfilling life, and uh, Renfield just kind of goes for it right away. Mina is uh, dying, and this is a scene taken pretty closely from the uh, Stoker novel, where in the Stoker novel it's actually uh, Lucy rather than Mina, but uh, they all watch her like gasping for breath, and it's pretty horrific. And it's never, it would never really been done 
partially because I think that any version of Dracula before this, this would have been a little too much, kind of for, you know, like it was when it was done in the 30s. That was when the production code was in effect, and Hammer was more about the theatrics of the Dracula character. But this scene is genuinely disturbing and kind of sad, but it's a good one in that, you know, it also shows uh, Dracula without the uh, theatrics behind it, without any of the, uh, you know, without the theatrics behind it. And it reminds you that what happens in, uh, what happens with vampirism is death. And that death is a very real concept. And Mina here, uh, they do a good job of making her look horrific. Like, all the, uh, color is out of her. And, uh, Donald Pleasance as Dr. Sword is a completely helpless doctor. <laughs> he doesn't know what to do, and he's dumbfounded by everything. And that's a interesting take on the character. Here we have Donald Pleasance eating again. He's got a face full of chicken and whatnot. And that's like the grossest looking breakfast I've ever seen that they had there. But, um... Speaking of kind of like the color of this movie, this uh, film had kind of a, I don't know what you'd call it, a George Lucas-esque revisitation by its director, John Badham. Uh, apparently, Badham uh, looked at the film and always kind of regretted, he thought it was too... Uh, colorful and that uh, he wanted to dial back the color a little bit and so when they released the film on at least this DVD edition of it that I think this one came out I believe in 2004 with the special features and such that they uh, took the color out through a, a special effects process and they kind of it looks duller now and grayer, and I don't know how the film looked before. I haven't seen any edition of it before this one, but um, it's really it's really a shame because I just am so against that. I think you know once a film is released to the public, it becomes theirs, and I. I wish, like, this movie could be released on Blu-ray. It hasn't as of this commentary, and I think it would look great on Blu-ray, you know, especially restored. Uh, but I I think the film must have looked a lot different. Um, I've seen the poster for it, and it's a, a very colorful poster. Langella looks incredible on it. And there's scenes of fog and a moon and a setting sun in the background. It's really breath, a breathtaking poster. Probably one of my favorite horror film posters. And this, I don't know how this looks. I certainly can appreciate Badham being proud of his film and, you know, having ideas for it. But, uh, just like when a film gets released, it's it belongs to the audience. And I think this movie probably looked better upon its release because there is a little sort of unnatural feeling to it. Here we have another example of what I was um, speaking of earlier with, uh, with um, how they rearranged the story to take some of the scenes from the... Uh, Transylvania and replace them in Whitby... And uh, here we have uh, Harker coming to uh, finalize the uh, deal to buy Carfax Abbey. And um, it's interesting. One of the things that I uh, like kind of about 
the vampire myth and the uh, original Dracula story is that a lot of um, instances are about agreements propelling the uh, story forward. And this is kind of what sets it all in motion. The whole, you know, idea of having a contract with a vampire that Harker invites him to London and that's what uh you know sets everything in motion it's kind of uh in some ways i think you could almost argue that dracula is kind of a i don't know an anti capitalist film in that regard is that these kind of this whole uh capitalist deal uh propels the story forward and you know the whole idea of Harker being this working man trying to make a name for himself and uh, Dracula is this old aristocratic count who sucks and, on the blood of the living and preys on the living it's an interesting aspect and it's a great way to look at the character I think the version of Dracula that does that the best is uh, Nosferatu because that's very indicative of the time it came and place it came out. But I think this version of Dracula, you could certainly uh, see it that way as well. You have Langella sort of sizing up. He's... Uh, his um, opponent there for Lucy's hand. And it's interesting uh, that um, what Langella does with the character as the uh, film progresses, I think. You know, he sorts to, like when the people um, start to realize that, hey, there's something, this Dracula isn't on the level, Langella keeps to that, uh, you know, his facade. Like, it's almost like a defense mechanism. He keeps to that facade, you know, keeping with his curtsies, but they become angrier, and, you know, there you see the predator behind it. This, uh, Seward Sanitarium, I really like this. This is a really strong instance of, uh, how the movie um kind of like takes uh everything for what it is like this actually looks like a horrible uh sanitarium and you hear the wailing of the lunatics uh this version does it probably the best and you see sword walking around saying prescribe them laud them <laughs> Like the strong painkillers, because he's a bad doctor in this. <laughs> but um, another version that did that pretty well, although it's much more theatrical, is Bram Stoker's Dracula. Like Renfield is in some contraption to uh, prevent him from attacking others and himself. And then they have people with uh, like these metallic boxes on their heads. They can't bite people, but this version is a little bit more realistic. It's really interesting. Um, oh, yeah. Very of the film. It's very dull and bleak. Jonathan's already beginning to uh, uh, feel that he has a competitor for Lucy's uh, hand. And we're about to be uh, introduced to Professor Van Helsing. And uh, Lucy um, is going to have dinner with uh, Dracula. And that's a really interesting uh, sequence when Lucy does that because it's... Uh, oh, there's Tom Pleasance taking another one of his... Uh, uh, candies. <laughs> it's 
See, this is like a beautiful looking film. I really admire the sets. That graveyard there is really horrific looking. It's the kind of stuff that you expect in a very good uh, gothic horror. Here's another image taken from the Stoker novel, uh, the idea of the carriage. And of course, Dracula has no servant, so he has to do it all itself. But what this version does is that it takes this kind of uh, spooky scene and it makes it uh, romantic, sort of, even with all the wolves in the background and the um, the carriage just kind of becomes its own entity. Like earlier we saw that um, the steps flailed out on their own, like clockwork. Here we're finally going to be introduced to um, Lawrence Olivier as Van Helsing. And uh, this is a version of Van Helsing unlike any that's come before or after. And I don't really uh, know really why. I like well yeah no I I kind of know why but I like am kind of interested in what uh um Lawrence Olivier's uh choices where they stem from what he does with the character he does some really interesting choices to be sure I like the fact that uh this that Olivier makes a conscious effort to remind us that Van Helsing is actually Dutch, you know, that's not a um, a trivial aspect of the character at all. It was a big part of the book, and the play, they make a lot of references to it. And so uh, Olivier develops this accent, but um, I think what you'll see with um, this Van Helsing, with what Olivier chooses to do, is that the character is a lot less loud than you'd be ex you'd expect to believe. He's pretty frail too, and you might say that um, that is because of Olivier's age at the time. I believe he was almost eighty when he did this film. But um, I think it's interesting in some ways and uh, it adds another dimension to the story because um, you know in a lot of versions of Dracula you have a Van Helsing who is like as strong as Dracula himself but in this one I think what Olivier does with the character is um, kind of show the knowledge of Van Helsing that he's sort of a quiet man you know the kind of the bookish one and he becomes a, almost a unexpected hero of the story here we have the courtship between Dracula and Lucy and and one of the as I was saying you know what Langella brings to the role is is greatly helped by uh, by um, what Kate Nelligan does as Lucy a blood one of the things I recall about Olivier in this role, and I believe I may have read it somewhere or in Badham's commentary. In fact, I'm pretty sure it was in Badham's commentary, is that, you know, a lot of people think of Olivier as a, as a kind of, you know, this method actor kind of in the vein of what, you know, maybe... Um, maybe Straussberg was doing, but Olivier, they said that he was very um, intent on developing that Dutch accent, you know, developing a trait of a character and then 
having the character stem from that. And that's a really interesting uh, approach to acting. I, I think it's, you know, rather than immerse yourself, kind of like build upon, you know, the little nuances of character. And then, uh, you know, that is a great approach and you know Olivier's rightfully considered a legend even though at this point in his career he uh wasn't really you know doing the same kind of performances as for the heyday but he's pretty he's pretty darn good in this I think Olivier he makes some interesting choices and you know above anything else uh their original choices that haven't been done before or after, and that's really what you can ask. I mean, that's really what you hope for in uh, an actor who tackles a role or a performance that is so iconic and that's been done so many times. Here we have another example of a uh, of a scene that was done. Uh, from the f from the novel, it's done in a different way here. Um, Dracula takes one of the sanitarium's patients' babies, or I no, I believe it's uh, actually Mina who does this. And it's a uh, in the book, it's uh, Dracula who brings a uh, baby of one of the peasants to his vampire wives, and it's a. Uh, really uh, an unforgettable moment in the book and it's done well in uh, in a, um, Bram Stoker's Dracula as well one thing I don't quite like a choice that this movie made is uh, the um, choice to make Mina Van Helsing's daughter, but I'll get into it. This is a good scene here. It shows kind of the courtship between Dracula and Lucy, and I think uh, what this movie does really nicely in this scene is that it kind of, you know, takes the uh, Dracula tropes, of, of course, that classic line, listen to them children of the night what sad music they make and uh you know like when Lugosi did it it was uh kind of frightening or it was frightening and kind of alien but when Langella does it here he chooses to do it in a way that uh it, like it's sexy and interesting and that's something that this Dracula does really well is that you know he takes the um aspects of vampirism and you know rather than play them for terror he plays them for mystery and fascination and uh what i haven't mentioned yet which i'm really surprised i haven't mentioned is um John Williams, who is, did the score for this movie, and it's an incredible uh, score. But um, what he does with it is, you know, Williams, of course, uh, he's done scores, great uh, horror scores. Like, you could almost argue that his score for Jaws is one of the most terrifying um, scores of all time, and probably the best for a, a horror films ever had. But, you know, this Dracula score, what he chooses to do with the character here, uh, isn't very frightening. It's more mysterious. It's about kind of the fascination of the character and kind of you know like it's mysterious but it's also kind of there is a sense of foreboding to it but you almost want to see what lies ahead
I love that scene here, and you have uh, Van Helsing with his magnifying glass, the drawings of the bat. You know, that's one aspect of the uh, Dracula story that is really, really interesting, and it's always drawn me to it. Um, the idea of kind of science and the fantastic and even religion, too, in that Dracula is so uh, against the idea of Christ. But um, with what you have with uh, Dracula is the fantastic, you know, the idea that the vampire has conquered any form of uh, science and religion. And then you have, you know, Seward, on the other hand, who um in the play, but even in this film, who's kind of, you know, confined to the world of books and the logical and, you know, medication laudanum <laughs> from here, and that he, you know, wants everything to be quantified and uh, explainable. And you have Van Helsing in the middle who reminds us that... Uh, the scientific uh, facts always started off as uh, something fantastic. That the superstitions of yesterday can often become the scientific facts of tomorrow. I think this is interesting here that uh, there's almost an apprehension between Kate Nelligan's uh, Lucy and uh, Laurence Olivier's Van Helsing. You almost get the sense that uh, she doesn't want to be around him, even though Lucy was her friend and that... Uh, she thinks he's kind of crazy, even though he knows, she knows that everything he suspects is coming true. Oh, here's a good uh, scene. You know, um, when uh, Van Helsing and Dracula meet, in uh, um, the original Dracula of Lugosi, there's almost an antagonism right away. But here it's just kind of, um, uh, you know, it's just kind of, um, they shrug each other off. He thinks that uh, uh, um, Van Helsing is nothing. But it's really an interesting scene. And like I was saying earlier, about how Langella plays with the um, courtesy of the, or like, kind of like, you know, the, um, how Dracula is courteous, you, uh, that you see him showing his true colors even as he's polite. And especially that scene there, like Langella's eyes bulge out at Olivia. It's really interesting. I like the fact that uh, Dracula's horse, that they kind of like play with the myth there. It's a good scene where Dracula's horse goes over the grave. And then they add something here with um, uh, the white horse being able to uh, stomp out a grave. And I've never heard of any... Uh, vampire myth doing this, but, you know, I'm willing to uh, allow them a new myth as long as they're consistent. And for the most part, this version of Dracula is pretty um, consistent with everything that's became before it, except for there's one moment where you'll see later that kind of goes against everything, but it's more of a goof. It's not for lack of trying.
There we have uh, Lucy taking off the cross and forsaking her friend. And, you know, it's almost, you can argue that, uh, that, um, this Lucy almost isn't likable, but, you know, I really don't agree with that. I think that, um, you know, for all the heroism supposedly that comes from Van Helsing and the will to fight off evil, uh, it's, you almost want Lucy to get what she wants because, you know, that, uh, you see that Harker is such a, such a boring character who, you know, just kind of has, like, the old-fashioned view of the world and wants, you know, just to have a trophy wife. But Lucy wants a freedom, and she sees it almost from Dracula. But one wonders, you know, one wonders how sincere, a sincere Dracula really is. And I think, you know, that's part of the appeal of this version of Dracula. You know, it's all about Langella playing a part. And, you know, do we see past everything? Okay, here... Oh, that's a good effect. The fog fading in on Dracula and him coming in. I imagine that this was done on Broadway in a very similar way. And if it was, you could definitely uh, see the uh, potential of Dracula and uh, L Langella's portrayal. Blood of my blood, flesh of my flesh. This doesn't happen in the Hamilton Dean version of the play, and it doesn't happen in any version of Dracula that's ever come before this. But, of course, it is the, you know, just every, uh, just Dracula doing what's always been hinted at, what's always been the subtext of vampirism, where you have Langella Dracula physically consummate his relationship with Lucy, where they actually have sex. <laughs> I like this. There's almost a uh, a shyness in Langella here where he admits to needing uh, Lucy's blood. And, you know, that's a really interesting take on the character where um, the vulnerability of what being a vampire is and that he's somewhat ashamed of the act of taking blood. And, as I was saying earlier, uh, you know, this movie may have been the first to play with the idea, but it's never... But, I mean, it's been done so many times in response to this, and it, but it's never been done quite as interesting as here. This is gorgeous here. The strobe lights over the act of love and them having sex. It's really and really plays up how mysterious Dracula is and the bats flying over with William's magical score in the background. I would have liked to have seen what this film would have looked like uh, before Batum decided to revisit it and take all the color out because I think this film would have, this scene in particular would have looked ten times better. 
And there was an interesting uh, shot there in the midst of them uh, making love where you see uh, some heads on spikes and that's a part of the character that almost isn't uh, visited all that often is that he's supposed to be the uh, mythical or the legendary Vlad the Impaler, the Carpathian warlord. Here we have them actually exchanging blood. Dracula cutting open his wound. And the look on Langella's face is fantastic there. He, like, he looks like he's uh, holding, or uh, he looks like he's really like the pinnacle of love. Or really just blatantly, whatever, what, what the hell do I say? He looks like he's having an orgasm. <laughs> Here's an incredible set piece where we see that uh, Mita is gone and we kind of see how she escaped and the whole underground system through which she hides and finds her way around. The mines, they run underneath the town everywhere. You gotta give Olivia, he's good and he's bucking around in the dirt and crawling around with this thing, you know. He was a trooper, I would say, to do it at this age. And here, uh, <laughs> you're gonna see Donald Pleasance taking a swig of his, uh, chocolate. <laughs> Here's, they do some interesting uh, choices. With, we're going to see Mina coming up as a uh, vampire. And I wonder... I wonder if this kind of is consistent with everything else uh, that uh, the film tries to do with Langella and eventually Lucy. But... Uh, But, um, they do a kind of horrendous makeup. They make her look really terrible. It's really an interesting makeup, too, because it's very much reminds me a lot of uh, Nosferatu and that the vampire looks more animal than human. But, you know, she definitely looks like something that's been dead for a little bit. Here we have the, uh most uh, blatant uh, breaking of the vampire rule where uh, you see Van Helsing drop the cross in the uh, water and then he looks into the puddle and sees the reflection of Mina which anyone who gives a damn would know that uh, uh, that's not how things work <laughs> but um you know i was listening to the commentary on this and uh the official commentary from john badham and he went into it saying he uh edited the film and as he was editing it he had this great uh scene here because like, aside from the vampire rules, it's a really creepy and well-shot scene where you have uh, Lucy, or you know, have uh, Van Helsing looking for the cross, and then you see, like, the water unsettle, and you uh, have uh, Mina as a vampire pop up. It's really a terrifying scene, but, uh, you know, in order to salvage it, Badham said, oh, I've got to think of a way... And, uh, um, in order to settle it, Badham's like, I gotta think away. So he comes up with this, uh, story where he says, uh, um, the reason you can see Mina's reflection is because Van Helsing put the cross in there, so it purified it to save, uh, Van Helsing. And that's really 
<laughs> kind of goofy, but you know, I can see why I wanted to keep the scene because it is rather, uh, it's an effective uh, visual. I don't know what uh, propels Harker to come back at this point, but um, he's such an uninteresting character in this. Like, you definitely see why Lucy um, is compelled to, uh, compelled to uh, Dracula. And I don't know whether it's a conscious choice. I'd like to think it is because as, um, because this really is Langella's movie. He is the main appeal of it. But it could also very well be that Langella is just so damn good in the role that, you know, we're, ma we're drawn to him above anyone else, even... Even Laurence Olivier, who's uh, who's considered the greatest actor of all time, but here he's so frail that you almost like he's just not as intriguing uh, as Dracula as a character or a performance. It's just the way things are sometimes. You look there, you'll see uh, Sylvester McCoy. Uh, I guess he um, originally wanted to play Renfield and audition for it, and he didn't get the part. They, I guess, thought he wasn't good enough for it, or he was too young, or wasn't his type. But they liked his uh, uh, performance or his audition so much that they wanted him in the film, and he's just kind of really nothing more than an extended cameo, but of course, you know, he went on to uh, play Doctor Who, and of course, recently he's in um, the Hobbit films as Radicast the Brown. Here's my personal uh, favorite scene from the film. It's the only um, time that uh, a scene is lifted directly from the Hamilton Dean play, and it's staged very similarly to uh, how it's done on staged. But um, this is the one. Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. This is the one instance where uh, Langella is like, brings it up to a 10 and like his intensity and just kind of like the, you're kind of reminded that um, behind Dracula's pleasantries, he's really a dangerous monster. Friends' difficulties. <laughs> I feared it might, my friend. That's a really uh, uh, um, an aspect of Dracula that I like, and Langella does it pretty well. The arrogance of the character. You know, that you someone who's been alive for so long, he just thinks that... Uh, no one presents a challenge to him. You're a wise man, Van Helsing, but one who has not lived a single lifetime, but not wise enough to return to Holland at once now that you have learned what you have learned. Those who have crossed my path have all died, and some not pleasantly. Oh, this is... This is just as good as when uh, Lugosi did it with uh, um, Edward Von Sloan. I'd even argue that uh, this one's a little better because it has much more, a little more intensity to it. But, you know, a lot of people accuse the um, 
Hamilton Dean play of being weak and a little too campy, but I love this scene, and I think, you know, it can be, um, there's definitely some traps with the Dracula story if you don't play it uh, with the kind of sincerity that it needs, but, you know, you see, it's not in the material itself, it's really with the actors and the direction and the music, and this shows what it takes to do a really strong Dracula adaptation. That's an incredible scene. You see uh, Dracula run out and then come out as a wolf, and it's uh, definitely a, a step above how they did it in 1931. You'll actually see the wolf, and you don't have Harker... Uh, you know, have Harker run out and uh, say he's on the lawn. <laughs> Harker doesn't even know anything. Please, for God's sake, will tell someone tell me what's happening. And they almost don't want to believe that Dracula is the uh, vampire. Here's the effect that uh, you want to see, because later on in the film, they do uh, acknowledge the fact that um, you do need a, or that vampires do not cast a reflection. They try to show Harker here how um, the mirror does not shine over. It's a really cool effect. I don't exactly know how they do it, but it, it's really interesting. You see Harker have his hand on one side, and the mirror... On the other. Some hideous monster. Here's another strong uh, instance of the actual, um, of this film vers versus a lot of versions of Dracula. Is that the... Uh, Heroes don't stay skeptics uh, for too long, you know what I mean? Like, I think a lot of Dracula films, you know, you, you the audience walks in believing in vampires. And, you know, to have a huge chunk of the film be entirely devoted to having, like, a Van Helsing character, um, to have a... Van Helsing character try to convince people that uh, vampires exist and have a, a skeptic like a Harker to just keep saying, no, it's just a waste of time. And so, and so, you know, it's just like, this is a strong version of that. You know, he sh shows them the proof and they all believe it. And now it's just about they're talking about how far are they willing to go to fight evil. And that's an interesting uh, aspect of the character. And it's, or it's an interesting aspect of um, the story that really hasn't been done before this. I like Kate Nelligan here. Like, as you see that she's something more... Uh, than uh, something more than uh, just her normal self, and then she's got a vampire in her. I like, I don't know if this is the intention or, or if this is another example of Badham's uh, sucking the color out of everything, but Lucy's face there is beautiful. The makeup on it, like, she still has kind of the um, sexual feminine quality, but um, it's something else there as well. Kind of very white and very drab, and her eyes are incredible too. They're very red. They almost have a red quality, but you still kind of see who she really is, you know, the who she really is. Here's another incredible set piece, and 
they make reference to the fact that um, they have a car, and that's a luxury at this time. And, um, ooh, that horse, you almost feel bad for it. But uh, one of the aspects of Dracula, and I think this is interesting, is our, the aspects of Dracula, the play, is they make reference to the fact that when it's contemporary to the 1920s, when it was first written, is that Dracula can master, um, can master the world, you know, because of the invention of the airplane and the airplane, you know, that it can travel and this one they have the car. Like, I think this is kind of an interesting uh, version, you know, that science and technology meet this old world menace. I despise all of you, get out of my way. Yeah, you never uh, see versions of Dracula like this where they all fight to uh, fight her to keep her from running off to Dracula. It's really a, a far cry from what uh, Helen Chandler did with the part. Here we have uh, Jonathan and Van Helsing visiting um, Dracula's Castle, or Carfax Abbey, as it's called. There's an interesting uh, scene coming up, and there's some great special effects here, too. But uh, I really like what they do here, looking through all the... Uh, catacombs and the graves but what they do here uh, is interesting especially like what Olivier does here it's coming up they're gonna open one of these uh, caskets and uh, you know uh, put the the host on there so it soils it for Dracula and I, I think you know one of the things that Olivier does with the character, and I imagine that that is partially what drew him to it, is that Van Helsing has a piety to him, that he very much believes that God is a good to uh, Dracula's evil, and um, I always think that's an interesting aspect of the character, because it's kind of a contradiction in some ways, you know, the fact that he's a man of science, but he still has a tremendous faith in a Christian God. And you all, like, a lot of the times, you kind of would think that those things are kind of at odds with one another. But, um, it's interesting. And I think Olivier, like, the moments... Uh, where he prays in this and where he um, talks where he um, uh, places the emphasis I'm sorry, I'm kind of enjoying the movie uh, where he places the emphasis on the holy objects there's always daylight somewhere on earth do I rest my neatest only to stay in darkness that's no, like, to be fair, uh, Stoker himself let Dracula move around in the light. It's just that his powers were diminished. But, you know, just like this, you know, it's kind of consistent. I mean, it's kind of inconsistent with uh, everything that's happened before. Or, you know, what's happened before the movies. This is a good monologue that um, Dracula says here. And like I said before, it shows, uh, you know, how arrogant Dracula is. 
and how he thinks himself to be above everything else. That's a really good effect. <laughs> how he turns into the bat. You know, like you have a um what's his name? Dracula. And then like he swats at him and then the bat completely comes out of nowhere. I like wanna know how that's done. Like did they just kinda uh shoot it differently? You know, like they just cut right away. It's a really a it's a really fun uh effect. Like and you know <laughs> the bat in this is um it's fun, but uh it the uh, special effect or the no not the special but the sound effect is really <laughs> goofy beyond belief. You know, like the flapping of the wings, you kinda wish that the sound effect was different because you really I think the bat kind of would have worked by itself. <laughs> oh, they really go all out. That's pretty horrific. His screaming there. And isn't that supposed to be enough to kill Dracula? All he does is bur he bursts into flames a little bit there. You th would think that'd be enough to kill him. You know, I... I I really got to get this movie on Laserdisc or VHS and see how the color would be because I'd have to imagine just, you know, seeing the poster and how it played with the imagery of the sun, that the sun would have been so much brighter there. You know, you, you don't expect that. Here, as I was saying, uh, the weight that... Um, Olivier places on the holy objects. There's a moment there, and uh, it's another uh, fact that uh, Badham goes into in his commentary about the filming of the movie, is that uh, Badham wanted Olivier to uh, pray over the imagery, uh, to pray over the... Uh, grave in English, you know, he thought that that would be enough, but uh, Olivier insisted that it was in his native language, which would be Dutch in this case, and Latin for the uh, actual prayer, but uh, he insisted that, and he said that he would go so far as to uh, not promote the film when it came out, had he did that, and but Olivier, you know, being the uh, uh, professional that he was, he did a take in um, English, just to you know show that he wasn't just this big shot who wouldn't listen to his director, but he wanted that actual take, and I definitely see uh, Olivier's. Um, intent there. It's uh, really interesting that he got so far into the character, and you know, you, you look at someone like Olivier, and uh, you really analyze their choices because he was such an incredible actor, and he obviously spent a great deal of thought behind every character he made. Here we have Kate Nelligan kind of going into uh, Lucy, and you don't really know how on the level she is at that time, you know, if she's under Dracula's uh, power. And you, uh, it's really kind of... Uh, she does this scene really well, and it's a scene that's done in... Um, every version of the story uh, least interestingly in Dracula, Helen Chandler but uh, she really um, there's definitely a falseness about her that uh, you know when, cause she's kind of falling into Dracula and she hasn't been able to master everything about you know uh everything, you know, about 
the bridge between being human and being a vampire. I like this, how uh, powerless uh, Harker is here. It's really incredible. And Lucy kind of like through becoming this vampire, she gains power here. And Harker almost looks really kind of pathetic here. He cowers in fear. He doesn't know what's going on. And Lucy kind of plays with his conceptions of her. And, you know, Harker definitely is attracted to her, but and he knows that before that something's wrong. And, but he's still, you know, just kind of so attracted to her that he lets her get her way. Yeah, there's... There's... Olivier doing the Van Helsing that I know, well, the Van Helsing that we all know and love, that he's, like, so stern and, you know, kind of arrogant himself in his own way. And I think that's... Now, there's interesting when she holds the cross there like, the color sort of returns to her cheeks. I hadn't noticed that before. I really am interested in seeing what this movie looked like. I probably could go on eBay and get a VHS copy of it, simple enough. Here we have uh, Renfield again. And he's, you know, just with... um. Just with a quick rewrite, Renfield could have been written completely out of this movie, and it would have it would have um, not really hurt anything, and probably would have even helped the film in terms of uh, pacing. But um, I think what Renfield, the challenge of the Renfield character, is that. Uh, even in the Dwight Fry interpretation, is that he doesn't really uh, do a whole lot. He's not an active participant in the story. He um, is horrible and eats bugs, but all he does is kind of deliver exposition and atmosphere. And, you know, that's those are important things, but, you know, unless you have really striking imagery in a performance, they're not really all that translatable to a film that needs momentum. And luckily for, uh, luckily for, um, for all film fans, the original Dracula had Dwight Fry, who was so good in the role and was so passionate. But here, it's just kind of throw away, except for I do like the fact that they actually have real bugs, I mean that's not uh, that's not anything to poo poo you know what I mean, it's kind of creepy that they actually have bugs and uh, you know, it's not theatrical at all Here Renfield's talking about how he wants a kitten to feed and feed and feed. And that's something that uh, really wasn't in any Dracula before this, but it's in the novel, how he keeps wanting to collect lives and how he thinks he'll do that is by working his way up the food chain. And, of course, the next uh, step would be a kitten, of course, You feel sorry for Redfield at this point. Because, like, that is really creepy. Red, he's crawling up the wall, and it's none of the uh, sexiness or mystery when Langella come to, comes to visit his uh, 
female uh, friends, <laughs> or not friends, it's female victims. Here we have Renfield delivering some lines from the uh, uh, the actual uh, 1931 film, and I think these are the only lines that, uh, or at least he had one line there that or borrowed from that film. But most of all, this is really kind of uh, punish me, torture me, deserve it, but please let me live. Yeah, Dwight Fry delivered that line to Dracula. <laughs> that's kind of well it's been against the character of uh, um, Dracula so far he just blatantly does it there's no build up to it whatsoever he just cracks Redfield's neck <laughs> you know uh, yeah, I admire that it's less cartoony there, yeah, there's no cartoon violence in this it's not like Hammer at all, which was kind of like the most violent Dracula up to this point. This is all for face value. What it is is what it is. You know, for all the strengths of this movie, it does have a weakness in that... Um, it has a weakness in that it has the same problem as uh, the 1931 Dracula, is that there's not really a whole lot compelling the plot forward, except for the fact that this film sort of has the benefit of the courtship between Dracula and uh, Mina. Or Lucy. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of scenes where they just kind of bide their time. Kind of, you know, at one point they'll talk about uh, vampirism. Another, they'll uh, have Renfield there, who's not really a part of the central narrative. You know, the central narrative is really about hunting down and getting Dracula. But... You can't really go into that all that much because the film stays in the same place for most of the picture. You know, it's in this Whitby. And I think one thing that uh, would help er, this film and uh, Drac er, this film and the original Dracula and the play is... Um, if it was closer to the Stoker novel, in the fact that at the end of it, Dracula does uh, retreat in a way that uh, they actually do have to do a little hunting of him, and they have to, you know, think about where he'd go next, and that's interesting. And to be fair, this movie does get to that point. We're sort of getting to it now. Dracula um, decides that he has to uh, leave and go to Transylvania, but he's going to bring Lucy with him. But I think what uh, I think the movie would have been a whole lot more interesting if the final act was completely devoted to this uh, chase. Instead, it's just like this huge uh, set piece kind of at the end of the movie. And it works well enough. Like, it's a well-shot set piece, and it's kind of... It's more epic than any version of Dracula has ever been before this. I think, um... I, I think the Bram Stoker's Dracula... Uh actually has the most momentum of any Dracula adaptation going into the final act. And I, I'm really thinking that that'll probably be a film to keep an eye out for if you're a fan of this 
podcast, I bet that you'll see it soon enough. But, uh, you know, I think that's a more interesting confrontation with uh, the villains, with Dracula, the villain, and the heroes, is that they actually go to a place where they're more vulnerable, and Coppola films it well. If they had brought uh, Langella to a version of Transylvania, I think it would have been pretty cool. And, you know, just seeing where Langella's uh, environment, where he, where he came from, and kind of, you know, how he draws his presence and his power from his native land would have been really, really interesting. Especially if it was done in a similar way to how to how they did it with Oldman because, you know, the castle there is really a part of Dracula's uh, character. But then again, you know, maybe that wouldn't have worked all that well because, you know, this Dracula is so classy and uh, interesting. He does kind of seem somewhat out of character in that, even though, you know, even though... You believe him when he says he loves an old house. But it's interesting. It's fun. It's fun. If we are beaten and there is no God. Yeah, that's pretty much Olivier's uh, central uh, uh, point of the character is that he is working to do God's will. And it's interesting. See, this is another version. I mean, this is another uh, reason why this uh, movie has a little bit of trouble in that uh, you don't really know what kind of time period this is. I think at the beginning it said that this was in 1913, but then these kind of ships are uh, not really a uh, time period. They would have been more in tune with... Uh, what was going on in the 1800s? And you're having um, you're having uh, cars, and then these old-fashioned schooners. But this is nothing if not uh, ambitious and well staged. It's shots at sea with that huge ship are kind of. They're really kind of cool, and it shows that Universal did care about the production value of this film. I mean, obviously, they spent, they had to spend a pretty uh, penny to get uh, Olivier in this. He, I think I heard that it cost like $10 million or something. They wouldn't be surprised. And, you know, even if this was just a paycheck for him, he's pretty good, but... I don't know. And that's really kind of like what elevates this movie is having someone like an Olivier because, you know, a lot of people say that horror films have become sleazy. And that's one of the benefits of Dracula is that, you know, it has that literary quality where you can get a good actor to be in it. I like the fact that when uh, they open up that coffin that Dracula is actually actually there and that he's not you know there isn't some surprise because in a lot of versions of the story uh oh there's the subtitle making a mistake it says Mina screaming I'm watching the movie on subtitles so I can follow it a little better <laughs> Here's we're going to see something that I think this is the only version of Dracula I've seen that's ever done this that has Dracula kill Van Helsing. And not only does he kill him, he kills him in a pretty brutal way, impaling him on the stake. I wonder what the choice to do that was. I think it would have been a lot more... Uh, Interesting if they had actually, you know, like if they had done this 
not as the final, um, not as the final, uh, act of the film. You know, if they had Van Helsing killed by Dracula while Harker still had to hunt the character and, you know, have him without his mentor. This is kind of an anticlimactic way to kill Dracula. You have the dying 80-year-old guy impaled, stick the, uh stick the uh, hook into him and, you know, but it's enough to impale him. I mean, it's it's kind of anticlimactic, but it makes for a powerful visual. I love Langella there, you know. He's the farthest away from his uh, classy self. He's, like, screaming and howling like an animal, and like he he's great there, you know, like his screaming and his snarling they're so undignified and unclassy. We have the son there killing him, and slowly you reveal that that's really cool, kind of playing with the color there. And you see, slowly see him grind away to dust. Oh, boy. This movie probably has my uh, favorite um, ending of any Dracula film. Badham uh, has the cape fly off. Dracula, and you see the wind take it away while Lucy looks on, wondering everything, and you know, you don't know if she's thankful for Jonathan and Van Helsing coming to save her, and you know, just, I think this is probably a uh, Williams's most unappreciated uh, score because this really <laughs> you, know, you know you almost get the feeling that uh, Badham intended for there to be a sequel because she's smiling there and you hear the wolf howling as if to say I'm out there yet oh boy it's a great movie, and like I said before, it's really probably the best version of Dracula, or, or not the best version of Dracula, but the best um, time, the best example of when Universal celebrated their monster heritage and brought it to a new audience, and I think this is a version of Dracula to really look into how to do the character. And, of course, Langella is incredible in the part. And what he brings to it is something very original. It's a good movie, and I hope you enjoyed watching it with me. Uh, I don't know what the next movie will be, but I wouldn't be surprised if we go back and regress into a little more monsters because I really do enjoy the gothic monsters. I hope you all enjoyed Dracula and enjoyed the commentary and you know if at all if you like this at all please leave a comment. I really enjoyed the comments I've received so far. I hope you all have a pleasant evening and if you love to be frightened, then watch this movie because it's a lot of fun.